Welcome everyone to build your community with crowdfunding. I'm Pam Shellhorn and I'll be your presenter. Um, civic crowdfunding represents an exciting new model of community development, potentially allowing citizens to lead the physical improvement of neighborhoods and building long-term community capacity. Crowdfunding really excites me. Um, if anyone read my bio, you know that I have been both a commercial lender for many years and also a small business development center director. Um, finding access to capital is really tough for entrepreneurs and everything I'm gonna talk to you about today regarding crowdfunding uh, is, is very um, relevant to entrepreneurs, but you're gonna see that the spin I have on this program today is gonna focus more on crowdfunding for community projects. Um, and I think this is really important for community development, community placemaking, economic development, um, just a variety or host of things what we can use crowdfunding for. Um, Next, what I want to do, and hold on just a minute, is I am going to pause this recording. Okay, so what projects could benefit from crowdfunding in your community? I actually have a list of things that I've seen crowdfunding used for, and I think it's a very exciting thing. It's an exciting uh, way to access capital that you don't have to pay back. Things like supporting, uh, okay, we've got someone putting something in the chat box here, business incubation, facility, entrepreneurial support, great. I've also seen it used for public art, community gardens, pop-up festivals, protected bike lanes, playgrounds, affordable housing developments, food banks, mobile markets, restaurants, galleries. And I've got one that's really intriguing me. I don't know if any of you in the group uh, have this in your community, but how to... Um, retrofit vacant shopping malls. I've seen plans um, worldwide on how they've taken shopping malls and turned it into um, affordable housing and sometimes not so affordable housing. But I think crowdfunding could fit into any of these. We have one more in the chat box. Artificial turf and lights for high school football field. Great. <laughs> you're, you're, you're in the right class. Great. Okay, so um, on with the program. Okay, why do you wanna use civic crowdfunding and participatory community development? Well, for one thing, um, there are funds that you can use directly or you can use it as matching funds. I think if anyone's on that has um, done projects, community projects before, sometimes you get a grant and then you're gonna have to have some sort of a cash match uh, using crowdfunding can be great for this. Uh, it's a way to enlist broader support in your community projects uh, out into the community and even out of the community, say people that have left the community but are still really interested in their hometown. It builds social capital. This is something most communities want. It brings people together. And I'm going to give you an example in just a little bit. It provides transparency and accountability and also inclusion and equity. It, it's, it's a different kind of a model. And because it is crowdfunding, the crowd is actually the community. And that's why it works so well in community development projects. Um, I see, let's see, a daycare facility and a new public plaza. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the next slide. And one more. Okay, here's some crowdfunding stats. I'm not gonna read the slide to you. As I mentioned, you're gonna get a copy of the PDF um, when uh, the program is over. Uh, but uh, one of the, a couple of things I want you to take a look at is first, a third of Americans are unfamiliar with crowdfunding. Actually, they may have heard of crowdfunding. I'm gonna say that that percentage is probably even higher than that, unless they've been involved in a crowdfunding campaign. 
The other thing is that average donors are between the ages of 24 and 35. Now, you need to keep that in mind as you're building your campaign because sometimes people that are older, especially those over 70 and don't use the internet a lot, you may have to find ways that they can donate to your campaign without having to go online. And um, that can be a little bit of a challenge, but it doesn't mean you wanna leave those people uh, out of the campaign. Um, proper marketing is essential. We're gonna talk a lot about that in this program. Um, and also just a few things if you're looking at a successful crowdfunding campaign, they're saying that 78% exceed their goal. Three, it's an average of 316 backers and the typical campaign raises about $5,270. First, you're gonna to need to select a platform and that has a lot to do with what type of crowdfunding you wanna do, what the project is, but just to let you know, there's over 500 crowdfunding sites worldwide. They're, the most popular for the donation crowdfunding is GoFundMe. The reward crowdfunding, Kickstarter and Indiegogo are at the top. In the UK, it's Crowdfunder, and in Australia, it's possible. Crowdfunding is used around the world. Um, it was originally used to finance creative projects like film, stage shows, music, technology. Um, and what we have is what they call the, the types of crowdfunding. There's two things you need to look at, and you need to be really careful with this, is that there's an all or nothing campaign or a keep it all campaign. What it is, is with an all or nothing, if you set a goal of $3,500 for your crowdfunding campaign, and this is Kickstarter, it's an all or nothing. If you do not reach that $3,500, you keep nothing. All of the money goes back to um, your donors or your um, backers. Uh, the all or nothing, though, is, according to the research, a credible signal to the crowd that the entrepreneur commits not to undertake the project if not enough is raised, and it reduces the risk to the crowd. You know, it's also good. I mean, if you, if you need $3,500 to get a project started, you're only going to raise $1,000. Well, you know, that, that's not going to be enough to do the project, so then you're not going to actually be able to finish that project. So, for that, uh, for that reason, it's good. The keep it all, like GoFundMe. Uh, GoFundMe is great because it is keep it all. I have someone who wants to write a book. Uh, she, well, she's actually written it. She wants to self-publish. She needs $4,000, but 1,000 or 2,000 would get her quite a ways to her goal. So she did a GoFundMe campaign and she's gonna be able to keep it all. She's asked for $4,000. If she only raises $2,000, she'll be able to utilize that $2,000. But you need to double check this when you're setting up your crowdfunding campaign because you certainly don't, it could be very disappointing if you set it up for all or nothing and then find out that you didn't reach your goal and you don't get to keep any of the money. You also want to make sure you review your fees and compare them. Uh, Kickstarter's fees, I think, have increased just a little bit, but you want to know about that. With equity crowdfunding, there are, there are dozens of equity crowdfunding sites, although equity crowdfunding, it's not as well understood, and I don't see it being utilized as much as I think it could be in doing community development projects. But there's Start Engine, Republic, Seed Invest, we funder, these are some of the most popular according to the web. And then some of the platforms actually offer marketing and other assistance. Uh, that's not really Kickstarter. They have a great platform. It's easy to set things up. It's the one that I'm the most familiar with, uh, but uh, some of them do actually do have marketing or other assistance for you. You need to double check that. You really need to take a look at your um, you really need to take a look at the platform and understand it before you actually uh, set one up. Okay, we're gonna, what I ta was talking about are pretty general uh, to all crowdfunding and I'm gonna get back to that, more generalization. But right now we're gonna break it down and we're gonna talk about the three types of crowdfunding and what 
differentiates them from each other. So we're going to just slide through this for just a little while. I'm just double checking our time here. First of all, there's donation crowdfunding. And this is what I was talking about with the woman who wants to self-publish her book. Uh, the donation-based crowdfunding is generally used to raise funds for charitable causes. Um, and one of the things you need to know is that people that donate on these sites do not expect any monetary or equity-based reward. Um, according to GoFundMe, 40% of the donations are $50 or less. So keep that in mind. Uh, and Friday supposedly is the most popular day for don donations. I was not aware of that. Um, some people sort of, uh, they think that a donation campaign has to be for things like, oh, you know, I need to have a surgery or I need to cover medical bills. But I just recently saw the Rockford City Market, which I was affiliated with them when I was in the Rockford area. Um, they just recently used ProFundMe to raise over $30,000 to support the market during the pandemic. Um, this supported um, salaries and other things. So don't underestimate a donation-based crowdfunding. And like I said, it's the most simple, it's the most direct. But like any crowdfunding campaign, it has certain things that you need to do in order to make sure it's a success. And again, the variety of uses, I've already mentioned all of those, but community art projects. And for anyone from the Ottawa area, you're gonna see a photo on the right-hand side. They did not use crowdfunding to put that, uh, to install that piece of artwork in Ottawa. Ottawa does a fantastic job with public art. And I'm really glad to see a couple of people from Ottawa on because I think crowdfunding, whether donation, rewards, or equity, be a great way to do more public art installations. Uh, the uh, artist, by the way, too, just for full disclosure, the artist on this is my best friend, Susan Burton. So she allows me to use photos in my programs of her artwork. Second one is reward crowdfunding. This is the one I am the most familiar with. Um, Rewards-based crowdfunding, it consists of individuals donating to a project uh, or a, a business with the expectation of receiving some sort of reward, generally non-financial. Um, some goods or services at a later, later stage. And there is no monetary or equity, equity gain as there is in an equity crowdfunding. Um, generally, the amount to start, the average is about 3000 uh, as far as your goal. Again, with Kickstarter, that is an all or nothing campaign. And the best reward campaigns last between 20 and 40 days. So it goes fast. Um, so if you're able, I recommend trying to find local matching opportunities. Maybe there's a business in town or a couple businesses that say, okay, for every, you know, dollar that you raise up to say this 3000, we'll match it up to the 3000. Um, that could be great. And it can help you already establish where you might be able to get some of that funding from. Now, what you want to do when you're doing a crowdfunding campaign is you have to make sure with your marketing that you're answering that question. Why should someone contribute $25 or whatever amount to your campaign? It's important. Uh, with Kickstarter, which is the example I'm using now, although as I mentioned, check out others, talk to other people that have done crowdfunding. Some of them might prefer Indiegogo for different reasons. Uh, you might find cheaper fees. The one thing you want to be careful when you're looking at not so popular crowdfunding campaigns is the fact that people are going in and donating money. And I don't know about you, but I am pretty careful when I donate money online, you know, and have to share my financial information. Uh, as we work with people in older generations, they're gonna be even more conservative around that um, feature. And so using a crowdfunding uh, platform that is reputable and well-known does have its advantages in that way. Uh, Kickstarter, 40% uh, of Kickstarter's campaigns reach goal, okay? It's not a lot. I mean, reaching goal, it can be tough. Over 185,000 campaigns since they started in 2007. 
Their most popular categories are dance, film, and video games, but I've seen um, funding raised for a lot of things. You cannot be a not-for-profit. You can be an individual or a small group starting a Kickstarter campaign, but they do not let not-for-profits on their site. There are other uh, crowdfunding. So if if you're a not-for-profit and you want to do a crowdfunding, um, and, and I want to mention this right now anyway, if you, after this program, you say, wow, I have all these questions, I'd really like to sit down and talk more about crowdfunding in a particular project, please feel free to email me. Um, I would be happy to work with your group on community planning or a, uh, a project, a community development project. I'd be happy to give you whatever information I can um, <clears throat> to help you get started with a, with a crowdfunding campaign. Uh, and generally on Kickstarter, you raise between 1,000 or 10,000, although I have seen entrepreneurs raise $60,000 in a week. I mean, it is a very, very powerful tool. Okay, the example of the crowdfunding, um, this is going to be quick. I'm just going to use the Mount Vernon Community Gardens. I helped manage their crowdfunding campaign back in 2016. And it's a great example. Um, you can see we actually built a 17 bed, which ultimately became a 40 bed community garden in a circle with now an herb garden in the center, in the center of Mount, Ver uh, Mount Vernon's Veterans Park. It's a 40 acre part in a very low income area. Um, Mount Vernon is only 13,500 people with a per capita income of about 26,267. Um, this is something, it was a request from the county board chair and a city council member to myself to start a community garden. Uh, it's always great to have the city behind you. I mean, I, I think that crowdfunding can be so powerful for small groups who want to do community projects. But if you're going to build it on city property, or if it's going to need some sort of you know, water insulation or anything where you're going to have to interact with the city, it's kind of nice to have their blessing first. So I, I'm not asking you to just rush out and do that. You do want to check with your city and possibly your county before you get started. Our Kickstarter campaign goal was 3,500, and I have to say that the response from the community was absolutely amazing. We raised $4,300 in 30 days, and also from that crowdfunding campaign, we received an offer from a local plumbing company to install all of the waters, all the spigots, uh, which ran, it would probably have cost us about four or $5,000 of in-kind donations. Um, as I mentioned, the number of beds, uh, but the city council actually approved a resolution to allow us to build the garden at Veterans Park, which slowed us down a little bit, but it also gave us the location that we really, really wanted. And it was in a low income census tract, which really helped because all of the people living in the neighborhood are basically pretty much low income, um, a lot of minorities and African Americans, a lot of children and young families. So what else we were able to do was provide a location for community events. One we called Pick or Treat, it was at Halloween, and the other was an egg hunt in the spring. And the very first Pick or Treat, we had over 230 people participate, 130 of them or more were children. Uh, we also had a farm to table event later that raised an additional 2000 and got us to a total of $10,000 or more, either in kind or from the crowdfunding, and that allowed us to build the whole 40 beds. The rewards, and this is all I want you to take from this, is the rewards that we had, uh, they came up with a really cute idea. They had a daisy level and a lily level. We gave away stickers, a shout out on Facebook. 
we actually ordered a, a local artist was nice enough to do the logo for us and we ordered uh, reusable bags uh, that were very popular as part of our um, reward system. And I'll go over some of those other rewards on the next slide. This is something, if you're going to do a rewards campaign, this is something you really need to think about. And I do this, well, I have a finance background, a very strong finance background. So numbers are important to me. And what I did here is I developed a spreadsheet to make sure that we weren't giving more away than what we were getting in our donation. Uh, I have seen reward campaigns that have done this. Um, let's say for instance, a book's gonna cost $20 to publish and they get a $20 donation and give the book away. Well, they've literally made nothing. And you still want to create a level of donations that you can invest in and use, for instance, in this case, to build a garden. So we set up these different levels. I calculated the Kickstarter fees, took that out of the donation, estimated the cost of the reward, and figured out the net donation. Uh, we did not receive any $1,000 or $500 donations. We did, however, receive four $250 donations, which really boosted uh, our campaign up. And uh, we didn't receive any $150. I think our most popular was $50, and some were at $25 or $10. The $10 basically so that you can allow others, you know, anybody, to invest in this. That's what builds social capital. That's what builds interest in your community development project to begin with. If you're doing a playground, if you're doing a, uh, you know, whatever, whatever project you've elected to do, you want the community engaged. You want them to support that project before, during, and after the campaign. Uh, so to allow someone to come in at a $10 level, they received a sticker and a Facebook shout out. Uh, it, that really helped a lot of people participate that probably couldn't have if we'd started our donation, say, at 25 or 50. Okay, now equity crowdfunding. I am not an expert yet on equity crowdfunding, but I find this so intriguing, especially for projects that I've seen that are on the plates of so many economic development people, community development people, cities, uh, small rural communities. Uh, equity crowd, crowdfunding is basically aimed at investments and long-term gains. Uh, donors are typically called, they're investors, they end up having an ownership share in the project, generally in stock. Now, this opportunity in Illinois, it's been going on around the world and it's been going on in other states longer than this, not much longer. Crowdfunding really got its jump started in about 2007, so it's relatively new. Um, but in 2012, the Jobs Act loosened those federal restrictions on who, uh, who can raise money and who you can ra raise that money from. But it really wasn't wi that widely used in until about 2016. Um, the thing with the equity crowdfunding is equity crowdfunding, like most investments in the United States, is controlled by the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC. They are a regulator. Um, it is very important to keep the SEC happy. There's several types of investors and several types of uh, things you can do with equity crowdfunding. What you hear with equity crowdfunding generally are two types. The Reg CF, which is what's called non-accredited investors. The people that are considered non-incredible investors, um, well, they can, they can invest as low as $100, but the platform that runs your equity crowdfunding um, campaign is going to be responsible for making sure those non-accredited investors do not invest too high. There are actually a lot of regulations, and by the way, where I at the bottom of the slide where I say recommending reading, 
If you want to do an equity crowdfunding campaign, I suggest you go in and read. These are the compliance guide, or that's the compliance guide, excuse me, for your equity crowdfunding from the SEC. And it's a great place to start. There's a couple other things I'll recommend as well that you read. Now, a CF is the non-accredited investors. The Reg D, that's another type of equity crowdfunding, that is only for accredited investors. Those are, they prove that they have the network to invest up to $100,000. Um, accredited investors are also the ones that can do the angel investing and the venture capital investment. Um, so, uh, a lot of times these Reg Ds make uh, investors, these accredited investors may invest in your equity crowdfunding, uh, but they can invest a lot more. Then finally, the Reg A plus, that's not, that is not related to equity crowdfunding. That's just another SEC way. Reg A plus, uh, let me, I'm just going to read this definition. Uh, it'll be a little easier than explaining it. Reg A is an exemption from registration requirements, allowing companies to offer and sell their securities without having to register the offering with the SEC. The issuer can only accept payment for the sale of its securities once its offering statement is qualified by the staff of the SEC. Still has to go through the SEC, but it's very similar to an IPO, but it allows companies to raise as much as $50 million without all of the IPO regulations and disclosures and legal documents. So, but Reg A plus, they, those investors may invest in a equity crowdfunding, but they don't have to be qualified for Reg A plus. Now this I heard the very first time I was talking to someone that was trying to do an equity crowdfunding campaign. And I am working with a couple of people that are trying to do a $600,000 equity crowdfunding campaign. I've learned a lot from that. Um, the campaign is still not closed. And I think right now they're only at about 80 or $90,000 that they've raised. Um, but they said, what is a reg CF with a sidecar reg D? I'm not trying to confuse you with all these acronyms. But the thing is, is what it means is that you can do an offering a crowdfunding offering to your non-accredited investors. And you can do a separate private offering to those accredited investors that can you could raise that $100,000, uh, you know, over 100,000 for each one of them if you wanted to. Um, the thing is, is, you have to be very careful. When people start to donate to any kind of a fundraising campaign, all right? they are going to, um, they're, they're not going to want to do multiple investments. So if you're going to go for Reg D investors, you may want to go for those larger investors first. Maybe you're going to get five that are each going to put 50,000 in each in the project. Do that first, then go out to the general public with your CF, your crowdfunding, your equity crowdfunding, and your non-accredited investors. It doesn't mean that those accredited investors can't donate to your equity crowdfunding or put money into your equity crowdfunding, but you want to make sure you get them in the right order. And I just saw someone the other day trying to do a regular fundraising campaign. They had already got out and gotten a lot of these larger investors to put in. And then they started another crowd or not crowdfunding, but another campaign and they weren't getting anywhere with it. And that's because they'd already used up all of those uh, investors that had more money or those donors that had more money. Um, you still need to run, market and run the campaign like a fundraiser. Uh, it may require uh, some educating. And, and this I've seen in the, the one equity crowdfunding I'm working on right now, or at least working with them, I'm not involved in it, um, is that People don't understand equity crowdfunding and therefore um, they are not, they're not investing. So you may need to educate them. Uh, what is it, equity crowdfunding? What is stock? How much stock are they gonna get? How much of the profit are they gonna have? Um, so it's gonna take some of that educating. Um, again, I recommended reading here. With an equity crowdfunding, you can raise up to a million seventy thousand dollars 
Uh, the CF investors, as little as 100, accredited investors up to 100,000. Um, now, what I see this being used for is like real estate. Uh, it requires property development and assumption of a profit. If you don't have a profit, how are you going to uh, you know, pay interest how is this going to work back to your investors? So, but I do have an idea, and that is for these vacant malls or a housing development project or a, a project that includes that property, uh, maybe a coffee shop or something like that. Let's say you're a small rural community and you have a coffee shop you don't want to lose. Okay, so maybe it's a group that can come together, do an equity crowdfunding campaign buy and rent, you know, uh, set up the coffee shop and then lease it out. But whoever leases it is going to have to pay enough to pay back, say, if there's any mortgages and also um, give investment income to the uh, crowdfunding. Although I have read there's a lot of research that says that those uh, people that do uh, invest in equity crowdfunding are not as interested in the profits like a, an accredited investor would be, they're not as interested in the profits as they are in interested in getting the, um, the project to move forward. Sometimes these campaigns take longer. Uh, you definitely want to have to talk to an accountant on tax consequences and a legal structure for this. It takes a lot more work than a reward or a donation crowdfunding but I can see it really working well for things where you get a $800,000 grant for a community project, but you have to match 25% of that. So where are you gonna come up with that 200,000? An equity crowdfunding campaign could be great, or even a rewards campaign could be great. Uh, but these are ways that um, you can utilize crowdfunding to, to be able to develop those uh, community development projects. You also need a financing strategy. I hope I'm not confusing any of you too much. I know it is confusing. Uh, there is actually a great uh, uh, case study that the Urban Land Institute put together. It was some affordable housing near, near Washington, D.C., uh, and they used a crowdfunding campaign uh, to actually, they didn't do an equity crowdfunding campaign. They turned it into $200,000 worth of debt at 10% interest. It was subordinated to all the other banks and mortgagors, but they did a $200,000 loan, uh, basically. I found it to be very interesting. Okay, um, this is sort of shows you where, and that's why a financing plan would be important. And again, if you have any more questions about this, please feel free to uh, email me, I would be happy to discuss this with you further, but I do know that it's somewhat uh, um, confusing, so I'm going to keep moving forward with this. Uh, just notice that their crowdfunding campaign was launched in February 2017, closed in May 2017, but that was long after they'd already got an acquisition lender, uh, someone to install and uh, support the solar and then basically they use the crowdfunding campaign and another loan they got from a community development corp to do the renovations. But as you see at the very end, that 10% loan they got from the crowdfunding, uh, they, they intend to refinance that where they did refinance it in 2019. 10% is a pretty high rate. Now there's components of a successful crowdfunding campaign I'm going to run through these pretty quickly. We only have about 10 minutes left. First, the host. The host is the organization that's trying to set up this crowdfunding campaign. Okay, whatever type it is, that host has to be ready to be actively support, or give active support in the campaign. You also need a campaign manager. That's someone who's going to commit every day to this. I did, and I worked as the manager of the campaign for the Mount Vernon Community Gardens. There was probably a dozen of us that were working on this daily. We have to have someone that can create videos and post those videos. And even three to six weeks before the campaign begins, you want to make sure that you've prepared your campaign materials, you've tested those materials, 
and you've built a backer slash investment con investor contact list. This is critical to any crowdfunding campaign. Videos and social media are so important. That video needs to be less than three minutes long. Uh, they recommend children, cats, dogs. If you're an artist trying to raise money for your work, show the artist at work. You want to be able to build that emotional connection to your crowdfunding campaign and answer that question, why should I donate? Okay, social media should be updated daily, every other day with videos and images of what's going on with the project. You want to keep people informed, you want to keep them engaged, and you want to keep that momentum going for your, your um, campaign. If you don't, you're not going to reach it. In fact, most of the time they say, first of all, there is uh, data that if you use a video, the campaigns that use video on average reach or, or they raise twice as much as those that don't use a video. So it's really worth getting that video done. It can be an organic video. It doesn't have to be professionally done. It just has to be something that really um, allows people to understand what's going on and giving, you know, answer that question, why should I donate? Um, communicating with your investors and backers. If you think you're just going to put this on the platform site and people are just going to come there and donate to your crowdfunding campaign, not gonna happen. And if you're on Kickstarter, the chances of your campaign getting to their front page are very, very slim, okay? You need to do a lot of in-person net, in -person networking. And that's where we were really lucky with that crowdfunding campaign for the community garden because we had people in the community that were really for this project and they were going out face-to-face sending personal me emails. We had a lot of support from the local media. Um, they really enjoyed watching this project come together. We created a video with two children. Uh, their parents were part of the group raising the funding. And these two children, I mean, they were just naturals. They were able to sell it, to, 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 to convince people to donate. They were great. You also want to be able to answer backer investor questions immediately. That's why that campaign manager is so important. Maybe you want more than one so they can help each other out. You need to update the progress with photos and you want to continue to tell that story. This is only going to run maybe 30 days unless you're doing an equity crowdfunding campaign, but still that's only going to be three or four months. So that's 30 days got to really work at it. There are PR and social media marketing services out there to help you. They cost money. Um, some people think they're valuable. If you're doing a community project, though, hopefully between the people in your community and also, say, uh, people that used to live in your community but still love their hometown, um, that's where you're going to get the bulk of your donations slash backers slash investors from. And also special events, although it's kind of hard during pandemic, special events to raise awareness about your campaign is really important. Okay, when the campaign is over, uh, your money is generally in the count within 20 days. Uh, you want to, if you're, it's a rewards campaign, you want to send surveys and get rewards out. If it's an equity crowdfunding, you're going to need to issue stock. Um, you want to continue to let your backers, investors know how your project is going. Um, there is some research on how many times backers and investors will come in to similar projects or even the same project more than once. But again, back to that Reg D versus Reg CF, don't use up your biggest investors or your biggest backers too soon. Um, for instance, Let's say you're doing the investors and they're people that could come in and give you 10,000 each and there's 10 of them, 100,000. If you start with a regular rewards campaign, they may put $1,000 in, not 10,000, but they may not come back. Now, some of the research says they will, but the majority of the time they won't, maybe about 20, 25% will. And then complete your project as promised. The interesting part with crowdfunding is not only do you not have to pay the money back, but honestly, 
the crowdfunding platform is not going to keep track of whether or not you have completed that project. There are no penalties. Okay. And even with the investment in stock, only about 26% of those actually manifest themselves. So in reality, all crowdfunding is donation crowdfunding. It may or may not work. And a lot of people understand that. Uh, although you're Reg D, your accredited investors are probably going to look for something where they're going to make the money. And then again, I don't know. There's a lot of people out there that love their communities and are willing to do it. I love crowdfunding because it is so um, it's so transparent and accountable rather than the way we've done fundraising in the past. Joseph, are you trying so to interrupt that, me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying that I'm going to, uh, we want to get uh, some feedback from the participant. And while you are talking, I'm going to be uh, launching a poll. There are two, uh, two questions, brief questions about, yes, please. Uh, you know, what we can use for the next uh, uh, presentation, any feedback uh, that we could get. So I'm going to be launching, you will see on the screen, the pop-up on your uh, Paul, two of them. And uh, Pam, will you be available after the presentation for a few minutes if people want to hang out a little bit? And yeah, if questions? they want to hang okay. out and ask questions, and I see there's a question here. So go ahead and throw that poll up for them so that they can uh, see that. Okay. And I have a question. How do you best identify or who will manage and spend the funds being donated? Um, that's what's really interesting. Generally, it's your host. The host is the one that will be spending the funds. But again, there is no, no one that comes back to see how those funds are being. Now, the community will, maybe, you know, I mean, as far as oversight, like, well, the, the garden never got built. Uh, for instance, uh, with the community gardens, part of the money that was set up is if they donated 250 or more, they got their um, uh, name on a plaque or a sign that has not been put up and this is like three years later but no one has ever complained but actually the host is going to manage and spend the funds that are being donated it's going to go into their checking account um thank you and if you would go ahead and do this poll i'd really appreciate it because we have another one i want to throw up there's another one do you see any problem with the local government setting up the crowdfunding campaign and handling the funds or should it consider setting up a separate independent citizens committee at least to recommend if not make the decisions on how and when to spend the funds this is something I think, depending upon the amount of money that you're raising, that you may want to get, actually get, uh, you know, an attorney or, you know, a, to give you some advice on that. Uh, because, uh, you know, I, I've not seen one yet where a local government has actually set up the crowdfunding campaign. It might be cleaner if you uh, set it up in an independent citizen committee but find a way, uh, a lot of communities have, and, and that's what they had in Mount Vernon. Um, yes, we will be emailing the PowerPoint, uh, Lauren. Thank you. Um, you have another poll, don't you? Yeah, it's not coming up. I'm trying to get the Oh, other it's one. not. You know what? I'm going to um, stop share results, relaunch. Power. Okay, I'm going to stop share results. Thank you very much. First of all, let me, I will answer this. I apologize. And I am also going to um, stop the recording right now.